I'll now hand over to Michael Shoebridge to explore agile models for capability development. Great, thanks very much, David, and thank you, uh, thank you, Rob. Uh, so I, I've got some slides. I don't normally do slides, but I thought with it being so dark and it being the last day and afternoon tea, you, you might need some slides. So uh, I hope these ones um, startle you and wake you up a little bit. Um, so here we go. I've got eight slides for you, and this is already the first one. Uh, let me start uh, with this one. So uh, the Australian uh, Defence Organisation and the ADF like partner militaries, uh, it, it's already a joint force and an integrated organisation. And as we've heard a lot during the conference, it seeks more power from deeper integration. And there are, there's some real power here, orchestrating multi, uh, multiple systems and effects over time and in different places, uh, and bringing together the, the different capabilities from these multi-domain complex systems. Um, and this deep integration has been the defining factor of defence's business processes, you know, whether it's force design, investment decision making, contracting, sustainment and operation. And the result of these elaborated complex business processes, like the things you see on, on this slide, uh, there are two primary things, I think. Uh, the result is forces that work well together and with key partners that are also complex and highly integrated and also capabilities that take a very long time to move from idea to reality. And there are some real successes. In fact, pretty much uh, Air Vice Marshal Denny's slide had them on there, Things, uh, except, uh, say, Collins. The Collins submarine, wedge tail, um, and also piggybacking on US uh, DOD processes that are eerily similar to defences, maybe even a little more complex and extended uh, has resulted in capabilities like the F-35, Growler and the C-17. So some absolute success and power from this uh, drive to deep integration and the business processes that wrap around that. So what's, what's the problem? Well, um, here's part of the problem and it's called um, the rest of the world. Uh, some of it is uh, time is not our friend and if these processes take a very long time, uh, and war is credible within this decade. In fact, it's happening now in Europe, so that makes it extremely credible this decade. Uh, then time is a problem. And that's that big bang uh, you can see on the screen there. That's in Ukraine now. Um, and war, so war's back in the world and it's credible in our region. And uh, we know that from government documents and from Europe. Uh, the second problem is that technological change in terms of real disruption is present and it's overturning expectations in conflict. So there's a picture there, um, bottom left, from the Armenian-Azerbaijani war in 2020, uh, where uh, small pieces of high technology, advanced missiles, armed drones, uh, destroyed the Azerbaijani military that was operating in a more uh, conventional, traditional way. Uh, there was the 2019 missile and drone strike on the Saudi oil refinery, um, despite their investment through time in extensive uh, air defence systems and sensors. And every day that the Ukrainian military conflicts, uh, that the Ukrainian military inflicts large losses and reverses on the Russian military, is another graphic illustration of change in warfare and overturning expectations. And the last one you'll see there, there's a picture of a Chinese hypersonic weapon test with that sort of soaring like beam going up into the sky and also uh, a, an assessment of the PLA's rapid progress and proliferation of unmanned systems, armed and unarmed or uncrewed systems. Um, so the scale and uh, proliferation of Chinese military development and adoption of novel weapons and concepts for using them, so not just the things. And then, of course, the technological change that's happening so quickly out, outside the military sphere. And there's an ASPI report there about quantum technologies and the way they're becoming uh, things that have real applications in our world and they're being applied outside the military sphere at the moment. So time and speed of change are part of the problem with um, doubling down on, on this deep integration. Uh, there's another problem because the downside of complex integration processes uh, looks a bit like this. Um, the, the Swiss Army knife is probably the most densely integrated joint um, 
joint uh, pocket knife weapon system on the planet. And I, there was a bigger one, but I couldn't fit it on the slide. So this one here, I think, has about 60 different functions on it. Um, but uh, while that, that's attractive in some ways, sometimes you don't want deep integration, you just want a really big knife. Or you might just want a really little toothpick. You don't want them all integrated into this giant complex packet. Uh, and another uh, result of the, um, of the extended and elaborate integration uh, that we see with, the, with uh, defence uh, and its whole set of business processes, not just the CLC, uh, is time. So I've got two pictures here that illustrate that. The first one is about the Hunter Frigate Program, uh, which is now delayed even further than its extended time frame of first delivery in 2034. Uh, that's 12 years from now, but it will be longer for the first ship. Uh, and then uh, just recently, the Prime Minister announcing a really good thing. 18,500 extra people into the ADF, um, a really big expansion of the ADF. Uh, the only downside there is that growth is to be achieved by 2040. Um, so time, time is not our friend with these processes that we have. That's, they're the downsides. Now, there are alternatives, and I think this is, this is the good news uh, part of, of my uh, presentation. Um, there are some real alternatives uh, available, and the first one uh, comes from an organisation that has a whole lot of attributes uh, and processes that really look quite a bit like uh, the Australian Defence Organisations and also its big partner, uh, the Pentagon, uh, USDOD, with its processes. And that business organisation is NASA. And the graph there is NASA's budget over time, with that peak being the peak of the space race. So um, why is NASA so interesting? Well, because um, it faced what government organisations don't often face, which is bankruptcy. Um, Congress and the uh, US presidents over time were not willing to supply the funding that NASA needed to keep operating to achieve its missions using the incumbent business processes and with the incumbent providers uh, that it had. And that was true whether it was building satellites, uh, launching satellites, or rotating crew uh, to the International Space Station, let alone doing things like returning people to, to the moon and taking people to Mars. So NASA faced as close as a state agency gets that isn't being closed, as close to bankruptcy. Um, and the result was that NASA was forced uh, by that situation to take entirely new approaches uh, to resupply, uh, to satellite construction and launch, and to uh, astronaut crew rotation. And um, it didn't do traditional procurement and traditional capability specification models, and it didn't do things that look like the ASDEFCON suite of contracting uh, documents and processes. Uh, what it did instead is it encouraged new, new entrants uh, into its market. So it displaced the incumbent providers and it displaced its incumbent business processes. And these new entrants did it their way. They didn't do it uh, the uh, contracting framework way that existed beforehand, and NASA needed that. So, uh, you know, two examples, Blue Origin and SpaceX. Um, SpaceX uh, started as, in a whole different way. It started uh, with cost uh, as, as a key thing to drive down and reusability of all different components and systems. Two primary design principles, quite different uh, to the incumbent business processes. Um, and uh, they had the necessary interfaces set by NASA, you know, like, well, uh, um, how, how did the uh, air crew module have to dock with the International Space Station? Some really precise specifications of that. Um, but pretty much the companies were able to do things their way. And SpaceX, for example, did it through digital design and rapid deployment of resulting systems and learning through failure. 
So in some ways, they looked a bit like Kim Jong-un's missile development program. You know, we hear about launches and things busting and burning. Um, but while we all chuckle about the failed launch, uh, anyone who knows what's happening is we know Kim and his designers are getting better through demonstrating what they can do and can't do. SpaceX took a very similar result. Uh, and the result is that um, NASA now is wholly dependent on SpaceX uh, for, for launches, and that's because they're able to do it at a tempo and at a cost that's unmatched in the market. SpaceX is now a very attractive global launch provider. Uh, and also on the um, crew, ro crew rotation to the International Space Station, so what a good thing now uh, that America isn't dependent on Russian um, uh, Russian provision of crew rotation to the International Space Station. There are now two uh, different uh, agile approaches that have been uh, contracted by NASA. One is um, Boeing with their Starlink, uh, which has yet to actually uh, conduct a mission, but it's close to its first one. And the SpaceX, which was originally conducted for, uh, contracted for 12 missions, uh, to replace uh, crew on the International Space Station and has now been contracted with a further eight, I think, because of delays in the Boeing program. But both those approaches by Boeing and SpaceX again broke the traditional uh, way of providing these space capabilities to NASA and they're delivering at prices that are um, well below the previous price of previous ways of doing business. So. Uh, a study of the two said uh, Boeing's able to do um, uh, a crew rotation at about $90 million per chair, per astronaut chair. Uh, SpaceX is able to do it for about $55 million. So they're both significantly cheaper than the previous model, which was unaffordable, uh, but there's still that differentiation between the two. Um, and then down the bottom, uh, we also know uh, that uh, it's not just NASA. The NASA precedent is really useful, and as I say, because a similar scale enterprise to the Australian Defence Organisation with similar legal and government and con uh, constraints and rules, but they had a unique urgency because uh, they had to continue to operate without the funding that, that they needed if they kept going as they were. But I've got some examples here of success in the Australian environment too. Uh, so the Afghan conflict, uh, Digger Works with uh, soldier combat equipment and body armour, uh, counter IED uh, development and iteration as the IED threat evolved uh, in Afghanistan uh, and protected, uh, mobile, uh, pre protected mobility vehicles, uh, the Bushmaster. They were both, uh, Diggerworks, counter IEDs and the Bushmaster all had that rapid iterative development because of the urgency of the operational environment and the fact that coalition um, soldiers were being killed and Australian in, Australia ended up suffering far less because of this really rapid uh, development and um, putting into the hands of operators the new kinds of capabilities, new developments in counter ID, body armour, further development of the Bushmaster, done with a cooperative effort between the end user, uh, science and technology, and the companies doing the actual production. A really tight, fast cycle, driven by urgency, like NASA with the urgent budget problem. Uh, and uh, at the Air and Space Conference, well, how could I not mention the loyal wingman? Uh, three years from idea to first flight, uh, now with its own special name, uh, and uh, looking like uh, it's breaking many of the rules in the capability life cycle, and that's probably a good thing. And the last one I have on there is, it's a loitering drone. It's, it's launched from a 40 millimeter uh, grenade launcher that is currently uh, carried by uh, Australian Army soldiers, and it's a fairly routine item across other armies. It's uh, developed by a little company uh, in Victoria, Defentex. Uh, they, they had the idea, it took them, I think, about 18 months from idea to first prototype. It got further developed, interestingly, with a small grant from Army Research, uh, but then it didn't make its way into the capability lifecycle or acquisition in Australia but it's in service, it's, it's seen service already with the British Army in Mali. And I think it's also been acquired by the Dutch Army. Uh, because it's so useful, and they found a way to accelerate it into the hands of their service men and women on operations. We haven't done that yet. Both those examples, Loyal Wingman and Defentex, are digital design and production approaches. Uh, and they're not really suited to the suite of contractual 
and other business processes that are in the CLC and the ASDEFCON suite of documents. Uh, they're, they're different. You'll be pleased I'm getting to the end here. So what, what are some, what's a solution if we think the NASA precedent is interesting and some of these Australian precedents are interesting? Well, um, there's, the approach Defence has been taking has been to streamline the CLC and to streamline the existing suite of contracts and other templates and documentation. That picture on the, the left there of the ASDEFCON review, extensive review by very informed subject matter people, deeply consultative, um, it, it produced many things. Probably a highlight was for complex acquisition, uh, the front end pre-investment process that used to take four years may now be able to take three years. And my point about this is these are marginal improvements around the time and motion problem, um, and they don't really resolve the problem. So um, I think um, streamlining the big machine and big business processes uh, won't produce the rapid result. There's still power in the complex business enterprise and producing things like wedge tails and columns, so it's not a matter of throwing away that machine. But this is where I think the analogy with the airlines is helpful. So I've got Qantas and I've got Jetstar there. Um, Qantas, when it was faced with low-cost startup airlines in the world, did what lots of other big airlines did. It tried to refine its business offer and streamline its costs and make itself uh, into a more affordable offering that would compete with the low-cost uh, airlines. Um, but it was hard because look at it, it's, it's flying those kind of aircraft and there is first class uh, in a Qantas aircraft. Turning uh, that premium outfit into a low cost operator was impossible. Uh, they needed a different machine. They needed a, a new enterprise rather than trying to streamline their current one. So they did what uh, lots of other airlines have done, which is start their own disruptive startup called Jetstar. Build it from the ground up without being uh, um, burdened by the legacy business processes and practices in the premium offering, the CLC, uh, and uh, the result is it's a really effective low-cost air airline built from the ground up to be that thing. Um, so I think the, the net result here is um, while streamlining uh, and trying to agilify this really elaborate integrated enterprise uh, can produce some improvements and, and they should be sought. Um, if you want fast integration getting into the hands of users, um, you need to think uh, differently and plan and operate differently and not try to work around the business processes but start a new one. And Space Command seems to me to be an ideal opportunity. It could be its own startup, uh, just like Jetstar was Qantas' startup. Uh, and in a way, not being deliberately not being burdened by the enterprise processes would be a really good first principle, particularly given, you know, I've talked about NASA and SpaceX um, and digital design. I could have talked about small satellites as well. They are all areas where the incumbent business process that defence uses in pursuit of complex integration is not appropriate and where the uh, advances of digital design and development and close involvement of the end user are possible and real. So um, what's the future? The future is two different kinds of machine, uh, two different kinds of restaurant. Uh, Defence currently is like a five-star Michelin restaurant that can produce uh, wonderful degustation uh, uh, menus and, and offerings. You know, each ingredient lovingly hand-selected crafted slowly over time into an exquisite product, a wedge tail or that fine meal you see before you uh, by skilled um, master chefs. Uh, and that's fantastic. You produce heirloom capabilities that are really powerful, but you don't have many of them, and they're very expensive, and they take a very long time. Um, but at the same time, Defence needs another kind of restaurant. Uh, what it needs is a fast food restaurant. It needs to be able to make new items quickly as, as uh, consumer demands change, and it needs to pop them out at volumes that the degustation chef just cannot comprehend. Um, it needs a whole different uh, approach to doing that, just like you won't see a Michelin restaurant um, producing McDonald's fast food at scale. So it's, it's, a, it's a case of needing both these different approaches uh, for the heirlooms, and for the rapid, uh, fast-changing technologies and consumables of modern conflict. And really, I, I just thought I'd just link this to AUKUS as well. I don't know how much AUKUS has been talked about, but when you look at AUKUS, 
um, it's got uh, a particular activity that must be done in this complex integrated way, the slow food movement, and that's the nuclear submarine program. To try and do that in a McDonald's kind of way uh, would terrify our UK and US submarine enterprise partners and probably create a whole bunch of proliferation risks. So the degustation, fine dining, elaborate approach of the CLC is probably underdone for the nuclear program. But the rest of AUKUS is all digital, like many things in the air and space domain now, you know, cyber, AI, hypersonics, undersea, beyond the nuclear submarine. Um, that really uh, is far more amenable to this faster set of processes and precedents that I've talked to you about. So thanks very much. I hope that's got us ready for some questions. <laughs>